Say amen like you mean it. Praise God. Well, you're welcome to be seated. Thank you so much. Thanks, team. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you. How many of you are happy to be in the house of God tonight? All right. Well, I'm excited to be up here. I, I'm honored to have the opportunity to minister tonight. And I, it's, been, it's been a little while, um, but I'm going to stay in theme on uh, blessings. Um, and uh, uh, my message tonight, uh, what I'm calling it is uh, the blessed life. How many of us want to have a blessed life? All right, for those of you that don't want it, I'll have your blessing. Is that all right? I'll take your blessing. Uh, but but uh, I'm going to minister tonight on the blessed life. And I believe that, uh, you know, there's no special, there's no special tricks. There's no gimmicks uh, in, in this, quite honestly. It's all in the Word of God. And so uh, we're going to read some scripture tonight. And I'm going to, I believe that God has uh, um, uh, given me a word of instruction tonight. Uh, for us. But uh, before I get into the word, I do want to honor our pastors, uh, Pastor Omar and Sister Letty. How many of you guys love them? I lo love our pastors. I want to honor them. I um, uh, want to honor our pastoral team and all the leaders that are in the house that, that help, uh, help manage the affairs of the kingdom of God here at Reach Paramount. Uh, you guys do a tremendous job, and um, I'm, just, I'm just humbled to be able to be counted among you. Uh, and I mean that in all honesty. Um, uh, I, I want to honor my wife and my family. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, I'm thinking about the blessed life, and I'm reflecting on uh, the goodness of God in my life. And uh, not to get too far ahead of myself, but when I say that uh, that God wants us to have this blessed life, and that's what we've been talking about, is it doesn't mean that that things are going to be good all the time. You guys with me there? Like that, 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 that's not what that means, but uh, to live that blessed life is having this assurance that God is working things out, that God is with you. Uh, Pastor Omar says it, it's, it's a Godfidence, right? Not confidence. It's a Godfidence. It's a confidence that God is working things out. But I'm truly blessed. I, I, uh, we're, we're going through graduation slash promotion season. I, I know that uh, many of you are graduating. Those that are graduating from college, those are graduating from high school. Uh, that's the season. And uh, in this this season, uh, we have a, a, a Madison, our 18-year-old, is graduating from high school, and uh, we're, it's just so exciting to be in this season of graduation and going through these accolades, and I reflect on my life and I say, my goodness, I do not deserve this. Uh, I was uh, I was with a uh, I was with a group of men on Saturday, and I was just sharing uh, sharing just real quick my testimony. And uh, you know, uh, uh, 25 years ago, uh, if you met me and you saw me, you would not you would not recognize the man that's standing here. And I give all glory and honor to God uh, for for what He's done in my life. That uh, I'm not deserving of God's grace on my life. Uh, however, He's been so generous to me. Uh, that I'm able to experience the things and experience a loving wife and a loving family, beautiful wife, uh, and a loving family, and uh, going through all of these things. And so I'm truly blessed. And as I was reflecting on that, um, I, I thought about tonight and just sharing out of the out of the Word of God, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and really uh, instructing on keys to the blessed life. And so uh, if you want to understand that, if you feel like, man, I'm just kind of um, I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to figure this out and and life has been brutal. Uh, Pastor Omar mentioned uh, the other day when he was ministering that life is like whack-a-mole. It's like one thing, you know, one thing pops up, uh, you resolve that thing, and then the next thing pops up. And it's like, uh, you know, you can never get ahead. But I believe that God, uh, that God wants to help us, and God, God's Word can help us tonight. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to read here uh, 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 Matthew chapter 5, uh, and I'm going to read just the first verse. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for instruction. We thank you, God, for your word. It's living and breathing, and it opens up our minds to, to, to your reality and to truths. And I pray tonight, Father, as I minister your word, God, that the Holy Spirit would minister to each individual in this room where they're at in their circumstances, God. Lord, you know all things, and I pray, Father, that tonight you would help us, give us revelation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
So tonight, uh, as, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, really what I'm going to do is kind of go through a survey. So I'm going to give you an outline, and then we're going to kind of walk through this. Now, this is not going to be a comprehensive study of this, because there's no way I could do that. Uh, but I just want to kind of go through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And you could read through that. But uh, really, before we, before we even get there, I want to kind of give you an outline here. Now, uh, you could liken this Sermon on the Mount to, uh, to Moses and the Ten Commandments. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, Jesus is on a mountain, and in, in, uh, in, in Moses' story, you know that Moses ascended to the mountain to receive the Word of God. And here, in contrast, Jesus is descending onto earth, fully man, fully, uh, fully God, to instruct us and give us wisdom. You could kind of see that the 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 uh, the Ten Commandments is a list of don'ts. Would you agree with that? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Right? Where the Beatitudes, as Pastor Omar has eloquently preached messages on it, and will continue to do that. You see that it's more of a do this and become this. It's really an embodying of the law, and Jesus comes and he embodies that, and he's teaching us how to live and how to. He starts to describe character and conduct of those who belong to the kingdom of God. And so, uh, and, and so the Beatitudes uh, were, were instructed in, in really becoming what, what, what Christ is model, modeling or exemplifying in his life. It's becoming more and more Christ-like. How many of us want to be more and more Christ-like? All right, some of us. Now, this is very significant. You, you, we just read in Matthew 5 that Jesus is coming, and he's not necessarily preaching. Now, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but it's not necessarily preaching like you would, uh, like you would look at uh, maybe like John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist came, and he was kind of open-air preaching, and he was preaching what? He was re- preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so this was, a, this was a message that was being delivered to the masses, and it was a call to repentance, and there's nothing wrong with that. We still preach that. However, in this setting, Jesus is not necessarily preaching to the masses. He's sitting down to teach and to instruct people that he has a deep concern for. You understand the difference where he's sitting down, and as a teacher would sit down and, and teach this lesson, really what they're doing is they're pouring out their heart. They're giving their insight and experiences that they've walked with the Lord, and they've saw the, they've saw the faithfulness of God. They've seen uh, the principles of God be played out in their lives, and now they're sharing it with people that they love. You understand, you, you understand the context of this. And so, so understanding this and understanding that Christ is sitting down to teach the disciples, this is how we should kind of interpret this as we walk through, uh, as we walk through this, this sermon or this message or really this instruction to life. So there's kind of four things that you can look at in the sermon. And here's your outline if you're taking notes. So the first thing is that Jesus begins by describing the character of the true believer. Verses 1 through 10. These are the characters of a true believer. If you want to look at your life and kind of put a mirror up in front of you, read Matthew 5, 1 through 10, and these are the characteristics of the believer. This is what it should look like in describing the character of the true believer. The second part of this is that Jesus begins to explain their calling or our calling in this world in in chapter 5, verses 11 through 16. Then he begins to talk about the conduct, how we should be conducting ourselves here on earth as believers, as those that have been impacted or those that have uh, the Holy Spirit in us in, in verses 17 all the way through chapter 7 through 12. Okay, so that's all conduct, how you should be conducting yourself uh, here on earth as a believer. And then the last thing that he does is that he clarifies our choices and commitments in chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, he starts talking about building your house on, the, on a solid foundation and not on sand. Okay, so, so here's the outline. It's, it, number one is describing the character. Number two is explaining our calling. Number three is specifying or, or really clarifying our conduct, how we should be conducting ourselves. And the last thing is clarifying our choices and our commitments. I think that this, this, is, a, this is a great thing for us to understand and to embrace. So the first thing that Jesus starts out in his instruction is uh, in the Beatitudes is Matthew 5, 
verse, uh, uh, verse number three, he says this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Now, Pastor Omar preached a message on this, so suffice it to say that what Jesus is saying, he's talking about what is the first step in entering into the kingdom of God, or what is the first step to walking in this kingdom kind of mindset that each and every one of us should have. The first thing that as Jesus modeled this is that he took on humanity. So as Jesus is incarnate uh, there with the disciples, he's modeling the fact that he's taken on the brokenness of humanity, the brokenness and the frailty of you and I, and he submitted himself to the will of the Father. So the first thing that we have to do to understand that as we're kingdom people or kingdom minded is that we have to submit ourselves and submit our will and acknowledge that there's nothing that we could do apart from Christ. So first, that's the first thing. So we recognize our spiritual poverty and our dependence on God alone and his grace. The second thing that, that, uh, that, that I want to look at is uh, in chapter, chapter, five, verse, chapter 5, verse 5, it says this. He says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, again, Pastor Omar talked about this, but we understand meekness or gentleness, uh, that, that often that's misunderstood. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It means that you're under control, man and woman. Uh, you're under control, okay? You, you model restraint. You're able to control your emotions and self-regulate, right? So meekness is strength under control. And so when we live meekly or when we live gently, we can experience a peace and contentment that comes from trusting God. And so there's times in our lives where we become anxious and we become, uh, we, we get ourselves into a place where we're trying to go and, and kind of outpace God and God is saying, chill, chill. When we try to go and do things, we undermine the sovereignty of God, understanding that God is working things out and God has called us to wait on him and to live our lives in a manner that displays meekness. And so what we do when we're living our lives of meekness or gentleness we're, we're really understanding what humility looks like, okay? So what does that mean? That means when someone says something to you or does something to you that you don't like or that you disagree with, you bite your tongue. You show a little bit of restraint or you show a little bit of humility. I know that's a, that's a tough word for us, but we understand that because we're cultivating this in our lives. And so here it is. Uh, maybe there's a situation that you're facing. Maybe there's a, a difficult person that you're facing. Understand that God is trying to cultivate meekness or gentleness in your life through that person. So tomorrow when you go to work, those of you that have a job, when you go to work and you see that person that uh, gets under your skin and kind of drives you crazy, thank God that he is cultivating meekness and gentleness in your life. <laughs> Post that on Instagram story. God is teaching me meekness and gentleness through this tough situation. Second thing I want us to look at is uh, pursuing righteousness and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In Matthew 5, 6, the Bible says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, what, 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 uh, what Jesus is talking about is this desire or this passion for righteousness. Now, this is not necessarily uh, righteousness to be able to obtain something that's a reward, but it's this, it's this understanding that, that God, I need, I need more of you. I, I can't, I can't, I, I can't go with what I have in, in of myself. I need more of you. I'm hungering and I'm thirsting for righteousness. Uh, David talks about the deer panting for water. It's like a longing for. Um, if, if anybody does any kind of cardiovascular exercise, uh, I don't do, well, I do a lot of cardiovascular exercise, but I'm not great at it. And so I sweat profusely. Uh, if you've ever seen me work out, 
And so I've, I've taken up running. And uh, when I run uh, for a short distance of time, uh, really any distance of time, I start to get thirsty and I start to sweat and I'm perspiring. And there's nothing like an ice cold drink of whatever it is that you have, right? It's kind of that same, it's kind of that same uh, uh, mindset or that same picture that, that, that Jesus is painting here is that you're longing and you're thirsting after something that will actually satisfy you. See, for me, I'm drinking lots of water throughout my exercise because I'm not necessarily satisfied. But Jesus says that he provides the water that will satisfy us and contain us uh, for all eternity. And so this hungering and this thirsting for righteousness is this passion or this devotion or this commitment to do what's right. Now, what's, what's interesting about this, this hungering and thirsting for righteousness, is this is a simple fact, is that it's countercultural. This is not natural to you. Naturally, we want to be vile. That's just our nature. We don't want to be righteous. We don't want to do the righteous thing. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us that enables us and, and motivates us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So as believers, we're called to actively pursue righteousness in every era of our lives. So personal holiness, this is the last thing I'm going to say on righteousness, is, uh, is, is personal holiness. The choices that you're making when no one else is looking. The things that you're looking at on the internet or in social media. Personal holiness. If, if, we're, if we're folks that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we don't have an appetite for the things and the lusts of this world. So we need to work on that. We need to ask God to help us. How many of us would say, God, help me in that area? Okay, all right. Got some honest people in the room. The next thing is reflecting on God's mercy and peace. Matthew 5, 7 says, uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. And mercy is really the hallmark of God's character. And this involves a willingness to forgive those that have wronged us. A willingness to forgive those that have wronged. Anybody been wronged here? Anybody been, yeah, you've been talked about, you've been used, you've been abused, you've been, yeah, 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 I see hands like this. Yeah, every time. All those. This, this merciful, this, this, this uh, call to showing mercy is a willingness to forgive those that have hurt us. It's to help those that are in need. It's to show kindness to those that have abused us or manipulated us or have, used or, or, or have abused us. And so we understand this, that as we extend mercy to others, we are able to experience the grace and the mercy that God has on each and every one of us. How many of us have been forgiven? How many of us have been forgiven? And so the same grace and the same mercy that God has shown us, God is calling us and really expecting us to extend that same mercy to other people. The next one is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And uh, Pastor Omar uh, preached this well. And, and uh, really the difference between the peacemaker and the peacekeeper, the peacemaker is the one that has a little bit of courage. That's the one that's able to step into something and say, hey, this is not right. And I'm committed, humbly, I'm committed to making things right. I'm, 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 willing, I'm going to speak into this thing because, because I, I care. It's not one that is passive. It's not one that avoids just to keep things status quo, but it's one that says, I see that something is broken here, and I'm going to step into this with the grace of God, with the humility that God has cultivated in my life, and I'm going to make a change. I think that there's, there's areas in our lives that uh, God is calling us to be peacemakers in, maybe in reconciling relationships or reconciling uh, uh, maybe relationships at home or even in the church where you would go to your brother or your sister and say, hey, it's been too long that I've allowed this thing to kind of fester between us and I want to clear the air and I want to make peace with this and I want to, I want to uh, reunite this relationship back to each other. Now, that's the Beatitudes. That's the, that's the conduct that each and every one of us should be exemplifying. But as you go on and you get past, uh, past, uh, past the Beatitudes, you start to see other things, uh, things like turning the other cheek. Matthew 5, 38, 39 says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match 
the injury. Now, let, let, me, let me stop here and let me kind of lay this out for you. So here it is that Jesus is now contrasting the law versus the fulfillment. So Jesus is not abolishing the law. We know that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so Jesus is showing you how do I embody these 10 commandments that, that have been given or the law that's been given. So listen to what he says. He says, you've heard uh, the law that says the punishment must, must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39 says, but I say, do not resist an evil person. And if someone slaps you on the right cheek, Offer the other cheek also. We're talking about cultivating humility in our lives. We're talking about understanding that God has called us to be meek. And I'm not necessarily asking you to be passive or to be a doormat. But I, I want us to understand that God has not called us to be this, uh, this big bravado kind of personality. But to be able to understand that, you know, turning the other cheek, it's, it's a radical call to non-retaliation. That means because you've done me wrong, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get you back equally. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to grace you out in that situation. Maybe there's some situations in our lives that we're facing and maybe it feels like it's hindering us, like we can't get over these things. Maybe you just need to start gracing some people out. Maybe some people did you wrong and, 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 and God is calling us. He says, turn the other cheek. He says, don't, don't, uh, uh, don't repay evil with evil, but show grace and show love and show meekness. So, so Jesus calls us to respond to hostility with love. So those that are hostile in your, in your life, those that are coming against you, those that are, 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 are uh, bringing anger and wrath towards you, you respond in love. So in our daily, in our daily interactions, as we're going out and we're facing different situations, we need to ask God. We need to uh, pray and be always in prayer saying, God, give me the ability to be able to respond in a way that shows your grace. Respond in a way that shows the godly character that you're cultivating in me. We're not seeking revenge. We're not vengeful. We're not looking for an opportunity to get you back or to show you uh, what happens when you mess with me? That's not what we're looking for. But we're looking for opportunities to show grace and opportunities to show love, even in the spite of those that come against us. Matthew 6 talks about prayer and fasting. And it says this in Ma Matthew 6, uh, verses 16. Uh, it says, And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, listen to this, that is the only war, reward they will ever get. And so what Jesus is trying to show here is that God has called us to a secret place. And, and there's no benefit uh, in trying to show yourself uh, holy, okay, like like, uh, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with posting scriptures on Instagram or Facebook. I do that too, okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. But when we try to, when we try to put on this persona of holiness that doesn't match our character or our heart, Jesus is kind of opposing this right here. He's saying, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the Pharisees that want to let everyone know how righteous they are. That want, that, that want to uh, promote and, and uh, uh, advertise how holy they are. Jesus emphasizes the fact that really our, the importance is that we get into a secret place, a place of sincerity and a place of, 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 uh, of private devotion where God can speak to us. I say this all the time. There's no more vulnerable place that you could be than in private devotion with God. I love it when we're here uh, at the altar and we're worshiping as a community. Uh, it's a beautiful thing, but there is nothing more vulnerable than you getting alone with God and praying. God begins to look at the deepest areas of our lives and the deepest areas of our hearts, uh, the, the areas that you've, uh, you've suppressed and you've hidden from everyone else. The Lord starts to point at those things. The Holy Spirit starts to point at that and says, I still see that right there. What are you going to get that right? We're talking about conduct. We're talking about our character. 
Our prayer life should be characterized by sincerity and intimacy with God. And I would, I, I would encourage you to set time aside every day. I, I would encourage you, uh, pray with your family, pray with your children. As, as you're dropping them off at school, pray with them. Model this in, uh, in, in your home for them. But more importantly than any of that, I'll, I, I'll stand on this, is that you find quiet time in prayer with yourself. This starts to realign our motives and our intentions and our heart. It starts to realign our our priorities in our lives. And God wants to deepen his, his relationship and deepen your understanding of who he is and what he's asking us for in our lives. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. I'm gonna read verses 31 through 33. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Listen to this. And this is a, this, this is a call to trusting in God. This is a word for somebody. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Many of us, we chase, uh, look, I, I... I, I work for a large corporation and, and a, a professional career, we, and we chase education, and we chase all these things thinking that it's going to fulfill us. And I'm here to tell you that when you get to wherever it is that you think in your mind that you want to get and things are going to be great, the, the uh, what, what is it, uh, the, the goal post is pushed back a little bit further. If you're seeking the things of this world to fulfill an internal hole or an internal thing that's in you, you'll constantly be chasing a ghost. Whatever it is, you, you, could, you could call it a career, you could call it a relationship, fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're pursuing over the kingdom of God first will leave you void. It'll leave you wanting for something else. And so Jesus is here giving us clear instruction that we are to trust in God, to not worry about all these things, not chase after all these things, but seeking the kingdom of God above everything else, living righteously, and that he'll give you everything you need. I want to encourage you that there's provision in, in trusting in God. And I, I get it. I understand. I, I worry just like you, okay? I'm, I, I'm, I'm nothing more than a man. I worry just like you. But this kind of helps reorient our lives, understanding that, God, you've been faithful in the past. God, you've come through. When, when I, 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 didn't figure, I didn't think there was any way that you would be able to make this work, you worked it out. How many of you have experienced that in your life? And so it's, it's understanding that. It's understanding that God has come through in the past, and God will come through again. And I understand it feels real. I understand that there's real anxiety about things of this world. But understanding that as we seek God first and we reorient or prioritize our lives in such a manner that God will truly give us everything we need. In this fast-paced life and things that are pulling us from one, one way to the other, reorienting ourselves or recalibrating ourselves and understanding that the kingdom of God comes first, it shifts our focus from the things of this temporary life and it reorients us and it puts us in perfect peace, understanding that God's provision is in our lives. This is a tough one, is judging others. Matthew 7 the Bible says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. How many of you like to be judged? How many of you like to be criticized? Anybody like to be criticized? Yeah, none of us, right? How quick are we to criticize someone else? I guarantee that there's folks sitting in this room right now saying, why does this guy keep on talking so long? You're criticizing. It's all right, I'm going to grace you out. But we, we criticize. We're quick to criticize. We're, we're quick to point people's, people's faults out really quick. Man, and God, God's trying to help us here. It's hypocrisy that's in our lives. All of us have it, okay? I'm not sitting here pointing a finger at you. We all have it. We have to be aware of it. We have to ask God to help us. Do not judge others, 
and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. Listen to this. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Think about that. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. We need, we need God to help us with our critical spirit. Parents, be cool with your children, okay? Just give them a little bit of grace. They're, they're children. I know they're crazy. I know. But I think that if we could show this, if we could model this in our home, I think God could help us. Having this critical spirit and just judging other people and, and, and saying that we say some crazy stuff, guys. I know I'm not the only one. I know all of us, we say some crazy stuff. In a, in, in a moment, we, we have a snap judgment and we say something and we kind of like cast this verdict on someone. Not understanding the grace and the mercy that God's poured out in each and every one of our lives. Jesus instructs us not to judge others harshly, reminding us that the same standard we use to judge will be applied back to us. And he uses this metaphor of the speck in the plank to highlight the ridiculousness of our judgment. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Moving on. Matthew 7, 12, it says, do to others what you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So this is the golden rule. This encapsulates, this is what I was talking about where Moses gave the 10 commandments. Jesus comes and he embodies those 10 commandments and he fulfills it and he says here, this golden rule, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So think about this. We have a value out in our hallway called grace and truth. And uh, there's, a great, there's a great message on it. You could go and you could find it on YouTube. But Pastor Omar talks about the grace people. Right? And, and, and the grace people, they, they want, you know, grace, grace all over the place. I mean, just like this, this, lo like this loose grace, like, hey, it's all good, man. Like, just do what you want, and God loves you. There's some truth to that, but I don't know, I, I don't know if I want to play in that place. Right? And then you have the truth people. The truth people are, are the people that are critical, okay? They're judging. They're, they're the people that are, you know, picking the speck out of their eye, and they got a big old two-by-four coming out of their face. And so the truth people are quick to give truth, right? Not realizing that the truth that they're giving, uh, one day they're going to need the grace that they're omitting. You understand what I'm saying? So, so they, they, they want to give you something straight, but, when, but when, it, when it comes back on them, they're asking, hey, hey, well, be cool. Give me grace. It's not fitting. It's, it's, it's hypocritical. And I think that once we could understand and accept the level of hypocrisy that all of us have in our lives, we could begin to become hum humble before God. And, and we could begin to allow God to work in our lives and allow us to love people as God has called us to love. So this is kind of the summary of this thing, that what Jesus says about the law applies to it as something being firmly re-explained, listen to this, I, the, the, uh, a, a, um, a teacher wrote this, he said that uh, what Jesus says about the law applies to it as something being firmly re-explained by his teaching. It, it is not the Mosaic law and of itself that has prescriptive and abiding character for disciples, but the Mosaic law, as it has passed through the crucible or really passed through this vessel of Jesus embodying all of these laws and embodying them and now walking with humanity and showing them what this looks like, he's passing this Mosaic law through his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. All of the laws and all of the prophets are all being embodied in Jesus as he's sitting with his disciples and instructing them in the Sermon on the Mount.
And I believe, this is what I believe today, is that God is calling us to understand this instruction and to apply this to our lives. Now, there's many of us that we could read and we could learn and we could do all this stuff, but where, where there's real change and real transformation that we're looking for is as we begin to apply these things, as we begin to show mercy, as we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, as we begin to live our lives out in a way that shows meekness or gentleness, as, as we begin to do all of these things, this is where the transformation begins to happen in our lives. I, 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 would, I, I would suggest this to you. Maybe if you feel like you've been running in, in the same spot, maybe you feel like you're on a treadmill in your walk with the Lord and you're kind of not progressing, you're in the same place, I, I, I would suggest to you that maybe you've not applied some of these things to your life. Maybe you're walking and you're living with bitterness in your life. Maybe you have a critical spirit on you and you're just judging everything. You're a cynic. Maybe you're, you're sitting at, at, in the church and you're just like, uh, they, they'll never get it right. They're always going to do this. It's always going to be bad. It's always going to be this. It's always going to be that. Uh, they have their favorites. Whatever it is, and it's hindering you from walking with the Lord and really fulfilling all that God has in your life. Once we start applying these principles and these law and understand this instruction, I believe that God could really begin to help us and move us past where it is that we found ourselves stuck. I'm going to ask the, uh, the worship team to come up, and I'm going to kind of, kind of bring this all to a close. I told you that this was kind of broken out in four sections, and the last section being that Jesus is clarifying our choices and our commitments. And if you read in, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus gives this very, very clear picture for each and every one of us. Now, understand what he did. He's, he's taken time, and he's got his disciples, and, and the people that make up the disciples and the Sermon on the Mount is, is a lot of different people, okay? It's not the 12 apostles. It's a lot of different people. And they're all sitting around, and, and Jesus goes through this great discourse. Some would say the greatest sermon ever preached. Goes through this, this great discourse, and he's instructing, he's teaching. He's not preaching, he's teaching. He's pouring his heart out to the people that are within an earshot of his voice. And this is how he concludes his entire instruction. Listen to this, what he says. Matthew 7, verse 24, he says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. I was, I was watching, I saw it on Instagram, I think it was. And uh, 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 it was new construction in Texas. And uh, there was a windstorm that came. Did anybody else see this? There was a windstorm that came. It was a big, beautiful custom house that was just being built. It was still sticks. And this windstorm came, and uh, the, the wind kind of whipped up, and it just blew this whole thing right, right over. It wasn't built on a firm foundation. Verse 25, though the rain comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on a bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I'm going to ask if you would bow your head and close your eyes and reverence to the Holy Spirit.